Hello on the Rockers. Don't rain on our parade. We are chatting with Broadway and regional musical theater stud. The man so tall and talented, he needs three names. Stephen Mark Lucas, hot on the trail of his performance as Nick Arnstein in the Broadway National Tour Funny Girl with my guest co-host, Broadway guru, Michael Ferreira, and me, a guru uh, of the bar of a Broadway show. <laughs> That's what I'm at. Raise a glass, let the drinks begin. It's on the rocks. <laughs> Life is a banquet, and most poor suckers are starving to death. I'd like to propose a toast. This is On the Rocks with Alexander, where I drink with your favorite celebrities as we talk about fashion, entertainment, pop culture, reality TV, and, well, that's about it. So pop a cork, lean back, and raise a glass to On the Rocks. Fasten your seat. It's going to be a bumpy night. Lord have mercy. Buns and bows and pantyhose on the Rocks podcast, the place where we're too glam to give a damn. Today's libations are brought to you courtesy of House of Love cocktails featured around the nation in your home, at the clubs, and on RuPaul's Drag Race. Get your case of totally natural cocktails ranging from mocktails from 4% alcohol to 12%. I have the 12%, obviously. Um, everybody say love. Follow us on Instagram and TikTok at On the Rocks on Air and on Facebook on the Rocks Radio Show. Send me an email. Book me for a pride, wedding, funeral, quinceanera, bris. I don't care. I'll show up. I'll host. Info at ontherocksradioshow.com. Send us your comments, guest requests, and guest questions. The show's presented by Straw Hat Media. You can watch and or listen to our now over 350 episodes at ontherocksradioshow.com uh, for free. You can watch us on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV on the Outit.tv app, Facebook Watch, streaming with pride on SVTV, and on Channel 31 on the East Coast. Hello, East Coast. We proudly tape at UBN Go Studios, your one-stop place for podcasting. All right, let's get the show on the road. Returning to On the Rocks, Michael Ferrer. Ferrara. <laughs> That's the House of Love cocktails hey. already <laughs> kicking in. <laughs> Michael has over 20 years experience working in the LGBTQ plus nonprofit community. Among his accomplishments, he started a youth mentoring organization called LifeWorks that is approaching its 20th anniversary, by the way. As an executive director, he led the efforts to raise almost $5 million to fund an AIDS monument in West Hollywood. He's currently part of a new organization, Out Athlete Fund, that will help support LGBTQ plus elite athletes as they train for collegiate, national, and international competitions while providing a safe and inclusive space for the athletes and fans, hello fans, uh, to gather and experience those competitions live. Michael had an early career in theater from the age of seven and has continued his love and support for theater by keeping it central in both his personal and professional lives. He has seen just about every single Broadway show every year. He's rubbed elbows and other body parts with numerous personalities for musical theater. Wah, wah. Uh, please welcome Michael Ferreira. <laughs> We were actually talking about that. There's some Broadway actors that have yeah. a little have a little shine for you. Um, okay, I know you love all types of Broadway shows: classic, modern, jukebox musicals. You saw Funny Girl on Broadway mm -hmm. uh, with our girl Leia Michelle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you even got to go on stage. I think we have a picture of you on stage after the show. I was the there show. with Hannah Waddington with, with actually, and she came to see Raman uh, Karimlo. Yeah, there yeah. we are. <laughs> there you are. Leia looks so happy. She's like, "Yeah, I'm happy to be here." <laughs> no, she was happy. Um, besides name dropping on behalf of you, mm -hmm. what did you love most? about the production what do you love about classic shows having their resurgence in theater today well you know that's a particular story right because that hadn't been done on broadway and since the original since barbara well and so we have some intel so elaney kazan was on the show uh -huh. um, and elaney kazan was the understudy for barbara streisand uh, that's right. And, yeah, and that's there was right. so much friction between so the two. Did, did you know that they went to high school <laughs> yeah, together? Yeah, yeah. So they were in competition even in high school. <laughs> Lainey took over one night that she knew she was going to take over. Mm -hmm. So Lainey Kazan's mom called all the press yeah. and they re-reviewed the show. And she wasn't supposed to, yeah, yes. wasn't supposed to put the word out. Yeah. Barbara was mad. <laughs> she was a little pissed. <laughs> yeah. Okay, back to you. <laughs> back, to, <laughs> back to the question. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I, I was a total gleek. So, you know, like I, want, I knew from the first time she sang Don't Rain in My Parade on Glee that, yeah. that she was meant to play that role and so you know I'm one of those people that like I just knew that I was walking into the theater seeing a performance that like I dreamed of seeing and I should be seeing um, yeah and it was fantastic but then you know everybody else in that sh that show was great I mean Tova like stole her scenes she was fantastic uh, Ramin was great um, it, it just 
yeah, it, it was not disappointing. And the energy that we sort of talked about it before that we came on, the energy in the theater was just beyond belief. Um, and have and being in a Broadway theater, which is typically smaller anyway and more compact yeah. and intimate, you just can feel it. It was just explosive. You were every you could tell everybody's waiting to stand up. They just wanted to give standing ovations. Well, yeah. I think you know we're so excited about the new stuff coming on. There are a lot of movie musicals <laughs> that we're we're, we're going to talk about, like what the future of Broadway looks like. But I think there's. There's a comfort in seeing a classic show that you know, where mm -hmm. you can sit and just enjoy it yeah. for everything that it's worth. And I love that younger generations are re-experiencing these classic shows. Yeah, you know, you and I were raised on our oh, parents' absolutely. recordings of every. Yeah, and even they're doing the shows. Like I've noticed that because uh, it's Bartlett Sure, right? That's been doing the, the did a bunch of the Rodgers and Hammerstein. He did that great King and I. He did South Pacific, and he actually the actors that were playing the roles. It was the first time sometimes I saw actors playing age appropriate. You know, for the roles, yes. <laughs> you know, you're like usually because, you know, I mean, I saw Reba McIntyre play Nellie Forbush at the Hollywood Bowl yes. and she's like 50 and, you know, Nellie Forbush is like 20. So I, I, yeah. I saw that production and she and it was great. Like was nothing. Perfect. I mean, Reba's and Brian great. Stokes Mitchell. Reba and Brian Stokes Mitchell. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. But like to have. Um, had to have people that were the age of the characters, yeah. you know, the Joe Cable be, well, I mean, I, yeah, the Joe Cable's got to be a young, strapping guy. <laughs> and, uh, you know, mm. we have our guest here, yes. Joe Cable. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, it just, that it, it was great to have the respect given to spend the money to have, make a great production, to have full orchestras, to, yeah, it was just, just great. Those shows are amazing. Okay, uh, we have a lot to talk about today, um, but real fast, I want to give you kudos. You have some good news regarding your nonprofit. Yeah. You're going to be going to France? What's, yeah, what's happening? Yeah, well, so, um, so the piece of it, the piece of Out Athlete Fund, there's the piece where we're creating a fund so that we're funding athletes so that we create equity so that, you know, we don't have an athlete that doesn't win the gold medal because their sled broke, which happened in Sochi. Um, but um, so we have that. But we're also doing this thing called Pride House, which is started in Europe. Um, but they they haven't really, you know, Europe's different around nonprofits, like government funds, whatever, yeah. nonprofit stuff is going. It's not individual donations or corporate and stuff like that. So we tend to do things differently here when we do nonprofits. Profits. And they think more in terms of the education, sort of the serious part of it. But we, American nonprofits, tend to think when we have events, they need to be fun. So our pride houses are going to be a lot more fun. Um, but it was um, sort of our idea to, to mirror the Olympics and do official handovers. So we're going to go, we're going to travel to Paris. Uh, the city of West Hollywood has made official that in 2028 during the LA Olympics, That's we're going to do a 17 day Pride House event in I'll West be there Hollywood all 17 Park. days. Absolutely. I'll be there 18 days if you have to kick me out. <laughs> so you're you're LGBT or you're an ally, you know, you'll have a place to go for 17 days. You don't have to worry about getting tickets to SoFi Stadium. You know, you'll be able to go to this place and be with your community. That's great. And people like Greg Luganis and Gus Kenworthy and Megan Rapino and all of them are on our, our advisory board. They'll See all me be next there. to Gus. Yeah, there <laughs> yeah. you go, right? Hey, girl. <laughs> and, uh, and so the big news is that, like, Paris, uh, the the uh, Pride House France, which is at the Olympics this year, um, has in officially invited us to come and do an official handover. That's Just amazing. like the Olympics are handed over mm. to the next city. So we're going with the mayor of West Hollywood and hopefully our county supervisor, Lindsay Horvath, is going to come too. So that LA is going to Paris to hand over this great thing. And it's a real big step forward, I think, for LGBTQ mm -hmm. athletes and sports and just you know, making sure that we're all just as welcome and we're just as safe and we're just as included um, as fans as well as athletes in, in sporting. And, you know, we know most of the world is is either involved in sporting or they're frustrated with the people in their lives that are. Yep. So, like, you basically, this is a great new, uh, you know, new uh, avenue for our fight for for you know for equality in the world um, and full inclusion and respect and all that. And athletes are coming out little by little. Yeah, in we every expect to have over four hundred out athletes at the LA That's Olympics. Amazing. So, which will be twice as much as has happened. I can't wait point. to turn on Grinder. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's bring on the man of the hour, Stephen Mark Yay. Lucas, a uh, New York City-based singer and actor. He's performed on Broadway in national tours with symphony orchestras and at the uh, country's premier regional theaters. He's appeared on Broadway as Elder Price in the Book of Mormon, understudying the role of Nick Arnstein in the Broadway revival of Funny Girl, and now touring as Nick in the National Broadway Tour, currently in Southern California at the Amundsen, and then uh, to San Francisco, and then to Orange County at the Segerstrom. He's established himself as a leading man at some of the nation's pre uh, preeminent regional theaters, starting as Gas 
guest on a revival of uh, Disney's Beating the Beast at Paper Mill Playhouse. He's appeared as Curly in several productions of Oklahoma. Look at th- look at that pose. Lancelot <laughs> in Camelot, and I have a funny Camelot story we're going to talk about. Uh, Lieutenant Cable in South Pacific, Sky Masterson in Guys and Dolls, Captain Phoebus in Stephen Schwartz on Back of Notre Dame, and Joe Hardy in Goodspeed Opera's House's critically acclaimed revival of Damn Yankees. His television appearances include FBI Most Wanted, Gossip Girl, and Empire Falls. Um, he's appeared as a concert soloist with Symphony Orchestras Nationwide. Let's get a sneak peek at his touring production of Funny Girl. Let's take a look. Don't tell me Direct from Broadway, like Funny Girl is musical comedy heaven, featuring celebrated songs like Don't, Don't Rain on My Parade and People. This hilarious, brilliant, and stunningly gorgeous production introduces rising star Katerina McCrimmon as Fanny Bryce. Don't miss the theatrical event of the season, Funny Girl. Playing April 2nd through 28th at the Amundsen Theater. Tickets at AmundsenTheater.org. Please welcome Stephen Mark Lucas. <laughs> <laughs> so you're handsome on stage, but like in person, I'm like, mm-hmm. <laughs> hello, gorgeous. <laughs> um, so we're going to start at the very beginning. Uh, born in Maine, uh, what I love uh, is that once a year, you and your family would go to New York in November and you would see like four or five shows listening to the albums along the way. I love that because that's mm-hmm. what you do every year. You go yeah. to Broadway. I grew up see- outside of New Haven, so my parents used to come. We used to go down on the train. Oh, yeah. That was, we would do the same thing. We So I grew up in Maine and my parents were not particularly artistic people. You know, my mom like sang a little bit in college or, or whatever, but my dad owned a business and, and it always was just like so out of character for them that they would like my dad would like run home with the you know the two CD set to Les Mis and put it on in the car and we'd all <laughs> sing along and it was it was just like it was very out of character for them but they loved it I love that and um, you know Phantom of the Opera was the first show I saw in, in London we just talking talking about about and at that, that time like we had the cassette tape like the two cassette yes. tapes <laughs> we put it on in my dad's wood paneled minivan and you know driving up to, to go skiing or whatever and we, we would we would listen to these show tunes and then um, you know my dad would get the Wall Street Journal and like look look in the paper to see what got the best reviews and then call Telecharge to get tickets six months ahead of time. We'd have the tickets <laughs> sitting on the kitchen counter, you so know, um, and look forward to and listen to the songs. Jekyll and Hyde. My dad still loves Jekyll um, and Hyde. You know, great show. So um, so that was sort of my theatrical education from a young age is just seeing how. It kind of brought our family together, and um, you know, we would go every Veterans Day weekend. We would go to New York. We'd pack in like four or five shows. Um, That's so Showboat magical. was the first. The Hal Prince revival of Showboat was the first Broadway show I saw. Wow. Um, and um, what an epic show, by the yeah. way, for it to be your first. show. And that yeah, was a great and it, I remember too, yeah. so, you know, like the overture starting, and they they lifted like giant bales of cotton out of the orchestra pit was the first thing you saw. Um, and it just transported me to this other world. And, and you know, my sister, you know, ended up being a lawyer. You know what I mean? So it was like, <laughs> it, it wasn't like really a family thing, but it, it just, at some point, I just kind of caught on to it. And and then, you know, I got to, to high school and college and realized like, well, this this could be a job and I, I could do this, you know, and, and it's been that way ever since. What was the first show that it really clicked though? Like, other than appreciating, but the first show that you're like, I'm going to do that. I want to be on stage. That's a great question. I think, you know, I, I saw um, Into the Woods. My dad brought home the, I'm dating myself, it was actually like the laser disc of uh, Into the Woods that had been like put onto a VHS. And um, I think it was watching that. And mm-hmm. and like I just loved for whatever, I loved Joanna Gleason in that show and Bernadette mm-hmm. Peters. And I remember... Um, the, the Ben Wright who played Jack, I remember listening to Giants in the Sky. And at the time, you know, I was young and I, I, I saw him do that. And I, I, I thought to myself, like, wow, that's, I want to do that. And then I played Jack in high school twice. I went to two different high schools. So I played that role twice in high school. Um, and it's still like, that's probably still, if you ask me, is probably still my favorite musical. Wow. Um, yeah. That's funny. Uh, Into the Woods was the first CD we ever bought in our household. My mom bought a wow. CD player, <laughs> and the first thing was Into the Woods, and yeah. it was the, it was the the disc, and it had the little like booklet with the mm-hmm. pictures yeah. and all that. And we would just listen to it over yeah. and over and over. Um, what kind of kid were you growing up? Were you were you a jock kid? We, obviously, you oh, did no. theater. <laughs> no, no. no. My so parents athletic. signed me up for well. Now I am, but um, my parents signed me up for soccer. It was the first sport I ever tried to play. That's and, where you get and, the legs from. Well, yeah, but but I um, 
uh, they they looked over a certain point in the game and I was like picking dandelions in the in the you know chasing butterflies <laughs> and they immediately put me in soccer and I literally was picking flowers yeah, yeah, off yeah, of yeah. the thing about sports was I, I you know I was interested in other things so I was all you know I, I played the trombone I was very you know I was in choirs and I did community theater and I always I, I gravitated towards the arts and my parents never forced me I mean my dad never like took me out and made me throw a football because it just wasn't what I wanted to do so by the time I was interested in playing sports or had enough you know uh, it was cognizant of the fact that like this is what I should be doing from a social standpoint you know I just didn't I didn't know I didn't know how to dribble a, uh, a basketball or a, I almost said a baseball <laughs> 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 but you know I didn't I, I just hadn't I hadn't done those things and, and so I, I just sort of I, I was kind of shy about it and I just never you know and then I got older and I started swimming I was a big swimmer in high school um, you know started working out and getting you know getting more athletic sort of on my own terms but it was just never something I, I really wanted to do as a kid you know what was that moment where you told your parents hey I'm going to be an actor and were they like a, a little bit. So they always said, um, you know, do it as a hobby. Do it as a hobby. Do it as a hobby. And then I actually went to boarding school. I went to Phillips Exeter Academy in in New Hampshire, yeah. which, you know, is sort of like a, a pipeline to Princeton and Harvard. And my sister went there and she ended up going to Harvard Law. And, you know, it, it, but, you know, it, it's a great education. And Your family it, must be so proud, by the way. Yeah, right. Can you imagine Thanksgiving at your house? Like, yes. <laughs> but they... they um, you know, so I had uh, they had a great music program at Exeter, um, and I didn't do a lot of theater there actually, but I sang in all the choirs and I I did a lot of music stuff. I had a great voice teacher there, um, and and you know it, it, that was where it sort of dawned on me that like, hey, this you know this could be a job, like you you could actually do this as a job, um, and and so you, you know junior year senior year I started getting ready to apply for colleges, and I told my parents I was like I want to you know apply to conservatories, and they. You know, took a deep breath and, <laughs> and you know, I think, um, you know, wanted me to apply to, to some liberal arts schools, too. So I did that as well. But, um, you know, I got into NYU, uh, I got into Tisch at NYU. And that, I think that's when it sort of turned for them. And they realized, like, oh, you know, he, he could do this. Um, so yeah. he moved to New York when he was 18. That's amazing. That's right. Um, I went in to go to interview right. in, in, at NYU and got yeah. so scared that I ran, <laughs> ran away. <laughs> it's very imposing. Like it, it is. It is very it is. imposing. And, and my even... first night in, in New York City, I mean, I, dry, I actually was doing a, a summer stock production of Grease, and my mom drove me overnight after the show closed to, to New York, and I got there at like 8 in the morning, whatever. My first night in New York, I went to Stonewall. Because oh, I, wow. I was like, I At 18? Wanted, yeah. I'm sure you were very popular. <laughs> popular, but I was like, you know what? I, you know, I had I had come out in in high school and and had you know, it, it was very different being in in a, you know boarding school in New Hampshire. And I was like, all right, I'm here. This is it. Let's yeah. do this. <laughs> wow. <laughs> was it a little culture shock? I mean, you weren't that far coming from Maine, but was it a little culture shock getting used to the city and and the community? You know. In, in in some ways, but I think that actually going to boarding school, I mean, boarding school, it was like a mini college. Yeah. So in some ways, I had kind of the college experience in high school. And then I felt like I had kind of done that. And so getting to New York, I kind of felt like I was ready for it. And I it was just a totally different. I mean, NYU is like a totally different college yeah. experience because you're just all over the city. I was auditioning. I was taking classes uptown. And, um, you know, it was just a very different experience. So I think by the time I got there, I think. I was I was hungry for it. So I have to know, uh, being at Tisch, you know, we can't all be a master at everything. What were your best classes? What were your worst classes? You're like, oh, I'm just oh not good gosh. at this. Oh my gosh, that's a great question. <laughs> you know, I think I always gravitated towards I always gravitated towards singing. You know, so anything to do with music mm -hmm. or singing, vocal performance, um, dance was was not my strong suit, and and it was really because, and this is interesting, I I I. Could be a good dancer, I think, but the studios at NYU were so small, and I'm a big guy, yeah. and the classes were so crowded that I, I always felt like I was gonna like <laughs> hit somebody. They called me a danger dancer. I would like do one leap and like, you know, like three girls would jump out of the way. You know, it, it was just like I, I just was sort of awkward about it, and I never really got um, got into it the way that I would have liked to. But but um, I also took a mask class once that was just like put on masks and you became different people, and it was it was I mean it was like the 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 full NYU you know experimental theater <laughs> experience which was great I mean in a lot of ways was, we did a production of Hair at NYU where nobody had any hair I don't know if you've ever heard about this no but hair production 
of hair where everybody was bald. We're on a really? budget. We're not going to have any hair in this production. The sun's very the a set in the future. Line. It was very. It was you know. It was everything was white. Nobody had hair. It was like it was the most sort that. of NYU thing you could think of. But it was, was your great. teacher, I mean, Mr. Carp. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> um, but the, you know, but that was so the, hilarious. <laughs> Let's just, do Aquas, but no horses. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it, you know, it like the thing about NYU, I think, is you're just exposed to everything going on in theater. It's not just about you know, mm-hmm. this is what makes you marketable marketable on Broadway. Yeah. It really is, you, you get exposed to all that different stuff and different theater companies that are working and doing different things. And so it was a really, like a very holistic education. It wasn't just about, you know, getting the next Broadway show or whatever. It was, it, I, I think in, in the long run, that was really good for me, you know? We have a lot of entertainment people that listen to the show. Um, so I always love to hear about the early professional audition horror stories. Oh, gosh. And oh, you had this done is theater, great. So, but being like, you know, a Big fish and yeah. a sm- you know a smaller theater, but now you're like. Pr- this you're- is a great story. So I, can't I, wait. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I so when I graduated from college, um, Xanadu was on Broadway, and Cheyenne Jackson was you know just in those short yeah. shorts, shorts, yeah. Yeah. thighs. Oh that made God. me come out with those shorts. Oh yeah. my God, I had seen it like four <laughs> times. You know, and, and you guys um, the, as the princes in Into the Woods extended for years. <laughs> Make it happen. Yeah. So so I had seen it, and I was like, wow, I could do that role. You know, and so. So I, I auditioned for it. They were casting the tour at the time, and they were looking for an understudy. So went in, sang the songs. They loved me. Did the scenes. They loved me. And they were like, nothing to do now but the roller skating. <laughs> and I had never I had never roller skated before in my life. So I was like, how hard can it be? So I like bought a pair of roller skates and like roller skated around the roof of my apartment building. <laughs> Like this is great. That's and such then, a New York story, by the way. Yeah, it's just some guy story. rolling. And I looked. There were no. You know, there used to be roller rinks, and there were no, there there aren't any anymore. No. So I was like looking around. Can somebody teach me? Like I don't know what to do. So I was like, ah, I'll just you know whatever. Put on the roller skates, and like it was a, as much as dis- I think at one point, like I skated like into the table where the director <laughs> was sitting, um, and I got up yeah. and I was Zenidu like, Zenadu <laughs> Yeah, and. and um, and so I, I was like, great, do you need to say anything else? And they're like, no, Stephen, you've done enough. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. There you go. Thank you. Now, when you first got into the professional world, um, and we're not talking so long ago, you know, um, and we've come so far in terms of LGBTQ representation, mm, yeah. but when you first got into the business, it was this kind of, you don't talk about your, your, your sexuality. Right. Yep. How are you dealing with that kind of coming into your own as a young man, but also conversations you were having with your agent and kind of, you know, playing the part yeah. of being a leading man because gay men were just not le- yeah. leading men. They just were not. I mean, you sort of had to yeah. go back in on the way. Well, yeah. it, it's really interesting. So Cheyenne Jackson really was the, the when I first met with my agent. So this is a great story. But my senior year of college, I auditioned for, for Glee, actually, when they were, they were trying to cast the pilot. And I auditioned for it in New York. <laughs> And had never auditioned for a TV show before. And I got a call from Jim Carnahan, who actually cast Funny Girl, the next day and said, they were flying you out to LA. You're going to test for Fox for Glee. And um, so I met with an agent at the time and, and did the whole thing. Came out here, you know, did studio tests, network tests, the whole nine yards. Um, and Corey Monteith got, got mm, the job. Yeah. And, I, you know, I went back to New York. But, you know, that was my first, like, big professional experience. Um, and, um, you know, I had a conversation with my agent after the fact. And he said, you know, he said to me, um, you know, we want you to be proud but not so proud you don't book the job. And that was like kind of a little mm. warning. And he said, you know, and I said, well, you know, I, you know, I really admire Cheyenne Jackson because he's, you know, he's, he was really at the time the, the only out leading man that I knew and, or, or knew of. And um, he said, yeah, but Cheyenne Jackson isn't a movie star. And and that just cut me to the quick, and I just remember feeling like, oh my god, what am I doing? Am I wasting my time doing this if if I'm not going to be able to be myself, you know? And there were, uh, you know, I have feedback, I have emails from casting directors going way back saying like, oh, Stephen needs to butch it up and and whatever. And oh it was never that. This is the thing, though. It was never about my work. It was never about mm-hmm. what I was doing in the scenes. It was never about my relationship with the leading lady. It was never about a kiss. It was you know the work was always solid. And I knew that. 
It was about how I walk into the room or how I talk to the casting director when I see them on the street. And that just always felt so unfair to me yeah. because you're not asking that of anybody else, 100%. right? You're not asking that of your straight actors. You're not asking them <laughs> mm -hmm. to play, you know, if an actor is playing, I don't know, Macbeth, you're not asking them to be Macbeth when you see them on the street. But you're asking me that I have to be Joe Cable when you run into me at Ripley Greer. I have to be, you know, Nick Arnstein when I walk into the room if I'm not doing the scene. That's not fair. Yeah. Um, and it created a lot of self-consciousness in me, you know. And so, thankfully, the business has changed a lot, you know. And now, you know, I uh, the, the cast of Funny Girl is very young. And I'm happy to report that Gen Z does not have that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They're yeah. like, you know, this is me. And if you don't like it, you know, fuck you. So, so it, 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 that is refreshing. Um, you know, and now, now and again, you know, people give you, you know, sometimes it's actor, uh, directors who give you notes or whatever. And you sense there's a little bit of that still from producers and directors. But um, at the end of the day, you know what? I'm an actor. And if you don't like my work, you don't have to cast me. But, but don't tell me how I have to behave, you know, when I'm not on stage. Like that, that was the thing for me always growing up. Well, and how does that play with your psyche? Because you've played Lancelot, you've played mm. Gaston, and these are like uber masculine. Yeah. And so as an actor, but also with your own, like having to like, oh, you, you know, you, yeah. I mean, it's literally being so self-conscious yeah. about every move you make on stage. And I will tell you, the audience loved you at opening night at the Amundsen. Like, absolutely loved you. I've never seen an audience respond yeah. to a performance at the Amundsen in my whole life. Yeah. Like they did. Yeah. But we had the gaze, and they're like, oh, my God, he's so passable. And it's like, what does that mean? Well, and it's such an this ugly is the term. Thing. This is the thing, is I'm an actor, and if I was going to play, you know, I'm playing a man from the early, ninth, of early 20th century, you know what I mean, who grew up in the 1880s and 1890s. You know, men, masculinity ha has taken different forms. And he's Absolutely. a casino man, too. Absolutely. And, and this is, you want to know how I think of it? It's, it's all drag. I mean, it is drag, mm -hmm. right? There, there are behaviors. Says. Exactly. No, there are behaviors. Um, you wouldn't behave the way that men behaved in the in the 1790s, you know, when people wore powdered wigs. I mean, that was different. And high heels. Men were high the first heels. people to it wear was a high different. heels. So I think it's not really about pretending to be something you're not. It's about really inhabiting the character and, and saying, you know, and, and I, I, I think because of the way I my stature and my height and everything, I do get cast in these sort of hyper-masculine roles. Yeah. So it is a skill I've had to develop. I'm not going to lie. I mean, it is something that I've had to work on. Uh, but I think it just comes back to being true to the text, you know, and and looking at what... I'll also say that for Funny Girl, you know, the idea of masculinity is baked into the show. I mean, that is really what is the undoing of this character of, of Nick Arnstein. 100%. He feels you know I mean? so emasculated. Is, he feels so emasculated. So there is my own struggle with, oh, am I, am I, you know, masculine enough for this is really his struggle too. And that's what I found in Lancelot, in Gaston, even to some extent that, you know, the issue of masculinity in the world today is this question of even the men who are the most hyper masculine are worried that they're not man enough. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is that's why we have these laws against trans people, yep. and, and mm -hmm. you know that's because people are being held to this standard that they don't feel like is fair. You know, so that's that is the story of these characters, and and my, I think my goal with them is always to find the vulnerability and to find you know what 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 does this person not have figured out? So most, most, you know, Fanny Bryce, most heroes in musicals start at a place of being insecure and become more secure as the story progresses. My characters are always the inverse of that. I don't really play heroes. I play a lot of villains. I play people who, uh, you know, are sort of tragic heroes who start at, at a certain place where they have everything figured out and then they get kind of unraveled as the show that's goes exactly on. exactly right. That's yeah. Lancelot, that's you know Gaston, I mean? that's and that Gaston. really exactly. is. Exactly. Yeah. So, so much so more there, I think there's too. something yeah. in yeah. that about, you know, uh, one of my very first classes I took with a casting director, uh, we were working on material from Les Mis, and um, she's the casting director for Les Mis, Mary Sugarman, and and she, um, I was working on the Marius material. She said, I don't think we you're... We were just talking about this too. She said, I don't think you're a Marius, I think you're going to be a Javert someday. And I was like, Ooh. What? She said, yeah, there's something yeah. very villainous about you. And I was like, I, I don't know what you mean. And now, 
you know, there is, I think, I don't, I don't know if it's the pathos in my past from being told I'm not man enough or whatever, but, but it's it, that there is something really interesting about that for me to play with that, you know, you meet these people, they're at their most confident. And then as the sto- story goes on, they become less so. And, and that to me, you know, where we, where we end funny girl, Nick has, has nothing, yep. mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like he really is stripped, stripped bare and has nothing. Um, and so that's, I, I don't know, a much, like you said, Mark a much Chabert. more interesting journey to play. Yeah, yeah, totally. yeah absolutely. Absolutely. I can see that. That's a, that's a really interesting discussion. Yeah. Yeah. What I love what you do vocally on stage is, you know, we see Nick and we have the powerful voice, your duet. Uh, I mean, th- there wasn't a dry eye in the house and oh. people cheered and cheered. I mean, the show literally had to like pause while people were cheering. But what you did vocally with your higher tones and when you went into that head voice, yeah. you know, that was playing with that kind of feeling that we see behind the facade yeah. of, of Nick. Yeah. And it was so beautifully done oh, you. what you did vocally. And I think that kind of played with... And I hate talking about like feminine versus masculine because we all have these qualities right. in us, but it's that broken part of Nick that yeah. was able to come to terms with his feelings. And when you went into that head voice, yeah. it, it displayed itself yeah. so well. I mean, you see it in a lot. You know, Ramin does it beautifully. You know, you see it in the Phantom of the Opera. Do you, you have see his text, by the way? Miz. Can we text him? <laughs> <laughs> I do, actually. <laughs> uh, uh, so it's funny. So, you know, we... Um, yeah, you, you see that in, in a lot of those roles, you know, that there's these moments of, of real fragility. Um, and I think that that's probably the most interesting part of it, mm-hmm. you know. When did you come out professionally? Mm. And, you know, because I did research, I read some of oh, your yeah. interviews, and a lot of the headlines said, openly gay actor. And it's like, well, we don't say openly <laughs> it's like, straight. It's your name now. Funny yeah. girl, yeah, <laughs> yeah. you know. Um, has... Does that help or hinder LGBTQ representation to be yeah. labeled as openly gay in headlines? Well, again, I think it's only something. Well, it's only something they say about people who are trying to play a certain type of role. I think you know that might not be true. I mean, there there may, but it's interesting. I've never been cast in a gay role. Like I can't get like. I can't get cast as... You're a, not gay enough. I, oh, I, I'm just, yeah, yeah. Well, that's how I felt for years was like, too gay to be straight, too straight to be gay. Yeah, like, that you must know, be a so weird it, place to it be. Is, it is, um, you know, it, it's an interesting question. I mean, I think I just never tried to hide it. You know, I really never... I just thought, I think from an early age, like... It, it's too much. It's too much trouble. You know, my one of my uh, you know, we talked about casting directors. And I have you know remember one of my first pieces of feedback was wore a tight t shirt, looks like a Chelsea boy, needs to butch it up, and I that that just like stuck in my head. And I think I, at that point I was like, you know what? Fine. If you wow. don't want to cast me because of a t shirt I wore, I mean, you know, I, I don't I, I don't have the energy emotionally to deal with that, you know. So I, I don't think I ever really tried to hide it or anything. Um and, and also like, you know, I'm a part of the generation that grew up before social media. So uh, you know, I, I, I'm uh, when Instagram and everything, you know, I just kind of was like, this is my life. You know, I'm, I'm very earnest with that part of my life. You know, Gen Z is a little bit more like, you know, they're a little more ironic about what they post and how they post it. And, and I'm part of that generation that was like, you know what, this is a picture of me and my fiance and you can like it or not. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And I think, I think authenticity is rewarded, especially in, yeah. in the arts. I mean, I think in the end, the audiences are looking yeah. for that. And this yep. whole game that's being played behind the scenes yeah. with you and other actors is like taking you away from what actually your job is. Yep. Your job is to make those moments truthful. Yeah. 100%. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I understudied Andrew Reynolds, too, in Book of Mormon. And mm-hmm. he was another person that was just so authentic. And that yeah. performance was so just the the epitome of comedic brilliance. And it was just so him. And actually playing Elder Price you know, was a chance, that's probably the most authentic I felt on stage because there wasn't this veneer of like, yeah. he has to be hyper masculine. I mean, he's a 19 year old Mormon missionary. Like, you know what I mean? Like that's, you <laughs> know. We've all had our experience with <laughs> Mormon missionaries. I mean, we have, knock, knock, come on in. <laughs> but it, you know, but it was, it just felt so authentically me and it still has that sort of journey of like, he really starts in this place of, of being the perfect Mormon and then uh, the, by the end, and he's like, you know, lost it all. And then he, he finds this place of sort of catharsis. And so, you know, like the, the, the I think the idea of what it means to be a leading man, the idea of what it means to play these roles is really has really changed a lot. You know, yeah. So I'm going to talk about Book of Mormon because we know your resume is full of classic shows. Yeah. You know, that that just is is part of Book of Mormon is probably the most modern show yeah. I think that you've done. Yeah. Um, 
Oh, in fact, we have, we have your p- pictures. Oh yeah, <laughs> right, right there. <laughs> Do you like being in the classic theater genre? Are those the musicals that you're listening to in your free time? Yeah. Do you want to break out of that and get into more m- modern pieces? <sighs> it's an interesting question. I mean, I think it depends. I've tried to do pop rock. I mean, I can sing it. You know, I can sing anything. I, I can sing. I've had great training. I've had great teachers. I can sing legit operetta. I can sing pop rock. Um, it's just the, that, you know, the true pop rock stuff, like there are people who do that really well, and I'm not one of them. You know what I mean? And I, what I do really well is is Funny Girl. I mean, honestly, what I do really well is the classic, you know, stuff. Um but, you know, there are composers who are more contemporary who are writing in that style. So people like Jason Robert Brown mm-hmm. and Adam Gettle, um, you know, Janine Jean, Tesori to some extent. So so th- that's the world I kind of like to live in, just the theatricality of it and sort of based on, on the more classical sound. Um, it's just what my ear gravitates towards. And, it, you know, and, and so... Uh, Mormon is interesting because it is contemporary, but in some ways it really is like almost <coughs> the template of like a Rodgers and Hammerstein mm-hmm. musical. You know, the beginning of so I like Believe is yeah. is the sound of music. I yeah. mean, yeah. you know, well, so there's those these guys come from musical theater too. Exactly. So, yeah. And they yeah. love yeah. musicals yeah. 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 and they, you know, it is built around the idea of a big old fashioned musical. Mm-hmm. You know, there's nothing cynical about it. I mean, it's really is just very earnest in its presentation. And I think, you know, that's the thing about Funny Girl too, is I remember walking in to the first day of rehearsal and David Zinn had the model for the set and it was this big red old fashioned trompe l'oeil drape which we have in our production I remember thinking like oh thank god we're just going to do a musical like we're not trying to be smart we're not trying to, to outsmart the fact that you, you see it now like all these Hollywood musicals are coming out and they advertise them not as musicals to like trick people into seeing a musical yeah. which to is great because dollars in, yep. listen I want more people <laughs> seeing musicals so whatever works mm-hmm. but you know, I remember it seeing like the lights around the proscenium and I was like, oh, thank God, we're just going to do a musical and not apologize for it, you know? And that, I think there's real power in that. And I think that's why our show has been so successful and there are other revivals too. You know, Music Man on Broadway yeah. did great with Hugh Jackman. That just I mean, popped into my head when you said yeah, that. Yeah, like a lot of Music Scott Rudin yeah. shows that, that he mm-hmm. did. You know, Hello, Dolly was great with Bette Midler and and um, like you said, the, the Bartlett Chair shows have been you know so successful at Lincoln Center. And and I think that that people do want to see a real musical, you know, an old-fashioned <laughs> yep. big Broadway show. And I think that, that there is real power in that, you know? 100%. And like how tumultuous is our time, you know? Ever since COVID, we mm-hmm. haven't recovered. You know, economy is everywhere. Politics right. is everywhere. It's so nice to return home and be in a safe space where yeah. you know the music and mm-hmm. it just makes you feel good. And I think yeah. that's why the audience responded so well at the Almonds. And it's like everybody felt unified at that moment. Well, I mean, where did musical theater start? It started with Oklahoma, right? In 1943. Yeah. What was happening? Shirley Jones did the show, by the way. Really? <laughs> yes, she did. <laughs> amazing. Oh, my God. Amazing. Uh, amazing. But that was World War II. I mean, that's yeah. what people, that was what that was about. That's was exactly- it was exactly about right. escapism. It was mm-hmm. about getting people in touch with an idea of community and, you know, l- allowing that to sort of strengthen the bonds of community in, in the country. And that's what that show did. And I think that that's what we can still do if, if people will give us the resources yeah. and give us the time and give us the exposure to audiences that, that want that. You know? and, and those shows actually, like, <clears throat> I think people that don't know them don't appreciate that, especially the Rogers and Hammerstein. Mm. Every single one of them took on things in society yes. that were, you yes. know, that were more, yep. you know, like South Pacific being one of my favorite because I got yep. to play Emil the back, like that that talk about racism in that yeah. show is very sophisticated yeah. and it's not like light it's right. not and south pacific is probably my 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 favorite show in terms of writing and construction i mean i've played joe mm-hmm. cable twice um and i just found it absolutely heartbreaking yeah. you know both times it's to really the best, you know best song in the show and the last time i did it yeah. uh, i did a production down in florida and gordon greenberg directed it and you know he started the rehearsal process by just saying you know think of these people being as far away from home as you can possibly get and being totally alone on this island and that just illuminated it in a whole another way that there's this guy from philadelphia you know, he's probably hasn't met anybody who looks like Leah, you know, and he's he's thinking of taking her back home to America where there is this intent. I mean, the, All the propaganda that, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, it's really if you think about it, like it's heartbreaking, mm-hmm. you know, and, and so I think we owe it to these shows if we're going to do them to do them with a sense of earnestness and respect 
um, and not try to be cynical or clever about it. You know, well, like you said, we don't have to hit the audience over the head with with, with anything. Right. And I know some productions, like you said, try yeah. to be very you know shocking. And it's like we get the message. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, um, and you're right. These themes are in uh, you know Oklahoma Carousel. You know, mm, uh, all of yeah. these themes. So I don't know. From an actor standpoint, you have played some of the most iconic roles, and we use iconic so often. But truly, you have played iconic roles yeah. that we know. We know these cast recordings. We know that scratch on our parents' record. Uh. Or, CDs or what have you. <laughs> yeah. As an actor, when you get a role like this and you're like, okay, we, we know what the character is, but how do you, what's your creative process mm. when you get a role and you're like, okay, this is my role now. Need to pay homage to what people expect, yeah. but I need to make it my own. And yeah. I mean, your whole resume is is full of that. Yeah. So what, what is your creative process? Well, I think in some ways, you know, it's being aware of the trap of these roles. Mm-hmm. You know, my acting teacher recently said to me, you know, nobody really wants to see you on stage as anything other than yourself meaning that of course there are you know there are changes in the the you know, the, the time period and the mannerisms and way people but people you know you're you're most successful when you are coming from a place of honesty to yourself you know so i think i always start with um it's like the acting 101 thing in 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 college where it's how am i a like how am I like this character and how am I different from them? You know, what are the, what are the similarities? And I, I, I find a lot in common with the characters um, that I play, you know? So I think it's really starting with the similarities and then looking at, okay, well, you know, what are the moments in this that I really have to honor? You know, you know, what, what makes sense from, from, or, and usually it's in the text, you know what I mean? Um, we're lucky with funny girl because people really haven't seen the musical. Hundred yeah. percent. I've so never true. seen it on stage. You know, what I mean, people have seen the movie, this and the, the first time you know, I saw Omar Sharif in the movie is giving a very cinematic performance. Um, yes, and that wouldn't necessarily work on stage. So it's 100%. it's because it's so small and so focused, and he's just so magnetic mm-hmm. on screen. To to carry a two hour and forty minute musical requires a different thing. You know what I mean? You've got to do something different. So I think it's also looking at that and. And addressing the moments that are iconic, whether they're songs, whether, you know, I think like You Are Woman, I Am Man is an interesting moment in our show. Um, Went to see Nick dance, by the way. I was like, oh, he's dancing now? (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. But it made sense. Yeah, I mean, (laughs) so that's so temporary arrangement was added added back in, you know, and originally, um, you know, Nick really wasn't a singing role. 100%. And so then, of course, you know. And then you come and sing like the way you did. It's like, holy shit. Well, (laughs) so they cast Ramin and then Ramin just took everything up to the stratosphere in rehearsal and they were like, all right, I guess that's what we're doing now. And me and the other understudies were like, okay, all right. (laughs) You know, but um, yeah, no, it's it's been great. And, and, you know, honoring sort of the jazz roots of this Mm -hmm. score, I think has been uh, something that, that, that we've really had fun with. Um, and just giving Nick more to do, you know, and sort of trying to see him more as a human being, I think, has been one of the, the goals of this production, honestly. Well, and, you know, we know Fanny Bryce is the performer, and yeah. Nick is a performer in his own right. Yeah. He's a shyster. He's just trying to make yeah. ends meet. He's the slick guy at the casino. Yeah. So to see him in a performance, yeah. was that was the role that he yeah. thought of himself in his mind, and totally. it just made total sense. Totally. Total sense. Um Okay, uh, we're going to talk about Funny Girl. We're going to talk about some of the themes. We're going to talk about you understanding. But uh, before we get to that, you're in a nine-year relationship. You're yeah. engaged. Yeah. Looking at your resume, seeing that you've traveled and you've done regional theater, and now you're on the road for I, I, I don't know how long. Um, how do you maintain a healthy relationship when you're gone all the time or you're in rehearsal? Yeah. Or sometimes you're so exhausted, you're like, not tonight, honey. <laughs> That's a great question. I mean, we, we are, we're figuring it out as we go. You know, we've we've been really great uh, the first six months of this tour. Um, ha- have We've had a lot of luck just in terms of lining up schedules. And now we're in a period where it's going to be a little bit longer because I'm on the West Coast. He's on the East Coast. He, you know, has uh, my fiance, Brian, has a lot of engagements in the city. He teaches. He does various things. Um, um, and so it's sort of, you know, trying to do the best we can, I think, at any given moment with the time we have available, you know, and just knowing, too, that we're both doing things that we're really passionate about and having respect for that. Mm-hmm. And, um, n- you know, nobody's job is more important than than anybody else's. And, you know, what I mean, that that just yes. like really trying to honor, you know, the commitments we both have and, and respect that, I think, is the key. Um, because I think it, it, you know, it can feel very much like, you know, I'm on the road, I'm lonely or I'm at home and I'm lonely. 
Um, and, you know, it's it's just realizing that we're two different people. We have two different careers and honoring that, I think, is the key. But also just just, you know, we try to see each other every three, four weeks, you know, and make that happen. That's like um, the perfect relationship for me, by the way. It's like, I don't need to see you every day. <laughs> like, what? And then, you know, I just we just spent two weeks together. So taking we do have some breaks in the tour. We have, you know, like when we had to go from the East Coast to the West Coast. We'll have a week where we, we get to go home, and you know. So I took a vacation in February. So we've 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 been really lucky, and and you know I think our, you know we've had had nine years of relationship prior to this prior to this extended time away. So we've really had a, a chance to build a solid foundation. I think. But there has to be that level of trust too. I mean, I yeah. saw some of the chorus boys in your ensemble, and I was like, mm, okay, <laughs> play the trombone for me. I could uh, be, I could be their dad. <laughs> you know. Girl. Um, but people don't realize um, and we've interviewed a number of people that are on tour yeah. people don't realize that an actor's life on tour even with all the media and the opening nights mm. and yes you have your theater family we know how important theater family is to us yeah. but it's still an isolating experience yeah. when you're going from city to city because you're not able to build yeah. your roots for too long yep. and then you're off to the next but you're kind of on your own yeah. too and the thing you know the first time I sat out and watched Funny Girl from the House in New York with Leah Michelle. You know, the moment that just got me was when she, you know, all the sort of ghosts of her past go away and she's left alone at her dressing room table. And the way that it was lit on Broadway was so sort of stark and it was just her looking in the mirror at the beginning of the show and then at the end of the show. And I thought to myself, like, that's really what this show is about, is it's about the loneliness of being a performer and how, you know, because you do whatever... At half hour your dressing room door closes and it's you and your dressing room mirror and that's it you know what i mean or you go back to your hotel room after the show and that's you're you're all you've got um and so i think that that that's something the show i think michael mayer really did well in this production is making it about the cost of of a, a performing career um but i think that you know it's important having a sense of community is really important um, finding your supports, you know, sticking to a routine, you know, with this role, I have to, I have to stay on my routine no Vocally, matter where I, I am. Mean, yeah, I mean, I hydrate no like, a, like a maniac. I, I go to the gym. I have to go to the gym five days a week. Because uh, there's that know. rope scene, by the way. <laughs> I'm surprised it hasn't gone viral yet. It's going to be viral. Uh, but there's a rope scene. That's worth the ticket price. Oh right away. It's like, God. hello, Nikki Arnstein, Nikki Arnstein. <laughs> well, but I think, you know, I, they, they asked me about it because because on, on Broadway, um, they asked me, like, do you want to wear a tank top for it? And I was like, absolutely not. Well, because I think that it's, I think that two things. I think that, that you know, Fanny and Nick's relationship is, is, is there's a lot of lust there. You know what I mean? So we're going to talk about that. Yeah. Because it's a classic show, but it brings up so many modern themes totally. in terms of body issues, mm. self acceptance, yeah. what we're willing to do. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> um, but I want to start of you coming to the role. So you yeah. understudied on Broadway, did, and we yeah. know. Uh, an understudy's life it must be the most nightmarish life in the world because oh you never God. know, like, you know, and you're like, did I forget that? Did I learn that? <laughs> yeah. Um, what was your rehearsal process like as an understudy? And do you remember the first night you had to go on? So it was interesting. So I was the, was the understudy. So there's a standby and an understudy. And the way that things sort of broke down with COVID, you know, I, I auditioned for the standby. Um, and they, they called me and they said, you know, w w the standby now has to cover Keeney and Ziegfeld. So we think you're a little too young. Will you come in and for the onstage understudy and be in an ensemble? And, I, you know, as we talked about, dancing is not my strong suit. Could have fooled um, me. Did, knew I couldn't tap. You know, I knew there was a tap dancing. I was like, uh, OK. So I showed up for a dance call, did a little bit of temporary arrangement. And then I, you know, found out I had the job. Um, but two weeks later, I got a call saying, will you come for your tap shoe fitting? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God. I went home and said, Brian, you have to teach me how to tap yet. So I was on YouTube, like, trying to figure out how to <laughs> shuffle step. Thank God. I got it's like those roller yeah. skate yeah. days. Exactly. <laughs> oh, it was very, it brought up, I was like, they're going to fire me on the first day. Um, so I got there the first day and Michael Mayer was like, oh, this is Steven. He's your non-tap dancer. And I was like, oh, thank God. But um, I had never been in an ensemble before. So that was a new experience. And, you know, uh, uh, Book of Mormon, I was a standby. So I had that experience of like just focusing on one role, yep. just doing that, getting ready to go on. Um and kind of knowing, usually having advance notice, to being an understudy, which was, you know, having to learn my ensemble track in the show, while also, you know, I, I covered the tenor, the Ziegfeld tenor, 
um, and then also covering Nick. So trying to have trying to learn Nick while I'm learning my ensemble track. And of course, it was COVID. We were all masked. We were testing every day. You know, it was crazy. So nobody knew when they were, would have to go on. Maybe for ten days. You know, I mean, Ramin got COVID very quickly. You know, and the the standby Jeremiah was on for ten days. So I had to be ready then. And you know what I mean. So it it was sort of. Um, you know, build the plane while you're flying it kind of thing. Um, and I actually didn't go on for, for quite a bit, you know, the way that things kind of break down with standbys and understudies and everything. But, but about a that year... That has to be frustrating too, by the way. It's like... Well, I, I think it's it. important to realize, you know, everybody has a different job. You yeah. know what I mean? Like an understudy's job is different than a standby's job, is different than the, the principal performer. Everybody has their, their job. And, and um, you know, I had such a great time in the production. I had such a great time with the cast and being an ensemble, which I had never done. I had never... Ha- you know, I'd always been in sort of my own dressing room by myself yeah. and being in a room with... With uh, you know our ensemble was was a new experience for me and that was that was so much fun and and um, but but about a year into the run um, you know they came to me so they, they said we want to give you some dates and so I uh, you know I I I you know did did the whole thing got ready had you have understudy rehearsal once a week so I had been working on it for a year you know so I, I had the once benefit a week of for time. such a big show yeah. scares me like, yeah that terrifies yeah terrifies and for me. a huge role too yeah. you know what I mean but um I I I am a workhorse I work on everything on my own you know I can't I, I can't just go on stage and, and wing it I really like if if they give me a no I'll go back to my room and rehearse it six times before I have to do it. I mean I just can't you know I, I just I'm not an impromptu yeah. type of performer I really <laughs> have to like rehearse things so I did you know I did a lot of work on my own I would rent a studio whenever I could and run through temporary arrangement because that song is a beast trying to dance it and then sing that huge yes. uh, you know amazing high ending um, so I, I would run that you know probably three four times a week even when I wasn't going on you know just to keep the try to keep the stamina up um and so it was a lot of you know it was a lot of work on my own and that that i think is you know that's the key in this business is like nobody's people aren't necessarily going to give you all the resources you need you have to kind of take initiative and do it for yourself and so i did so i went on the first time i I, they gave me a weekend so i went on with julie banco the first time who was just such an incredible artist and and actress in the role and uh brought something to it that i think you know was so special and so detail oriented and and um did did my first sort of weekend with her and and uh, you know i had it was like all the work that i had done for that year leading up to it really paid off and i was really proud of that you know uh of course the first you know the first two three times doing it was like a total out of body experience yeah. you know i was like i know my body's doing it i don't know how <laughs> you know what i mean um and that's the thing about being an understudy is you're always sort of shot out of a cannon. Your, your nervous system is always sort of haywire doing it. And so getting the chance to do it, you know, in this production was a new experience because it, it really, you know, to take ownership of it and do it eight times a week and learn it in a different way was a, was a new experience. So then anyway, I, I got to go on um, then a little bit later in the run with Leah Michelle, okay. um, which I was so intimidated by her. I was so I was like, oh, my God. You know, she was so phenomenal in the role and, and was so generous and warm and kind to everybody. But I was like, well, now I'm her co-star. I have a different responsibility to her. Am I going to be able and to... And you can't put her on a pedestal when you have to Right, match and you have that. to match yeah. her energy yep. and be with her and, and also, you know, not and try, try not to get in her yeah. way, honestly. You know what I mean? Um, and so, you know, I was so anxious and she just... she just took me in her hands and just delivered me to the audience with her and it was a team effort and that was that was probably the one of the most meaningful experiences of my career was just feeling how she just brought me center stage with her and you know really was like this is our show together even though she was the star you know and that was that was was just such an incredible experience um and then ramin left um last summer left to do a production of fan of the opera in italy and i got to do the role for three like and a half three weeks, weeks yeah. while he was gone yeah, yeah. and so that as an understudy it's like you don't get you don't get better than that you know what i mean like really so i, I a lot of it was luck honestly in terms of timing and different you know uh different things having to pan out different covers and different understudies and everything but it was really you know just such a meaningful progression i think to start in the ensemble to to learn this role on my own and then get to do it and then get to do it for three weeks with lee michelle was just it was a dream i want to know how your interpretation of nick changed the most from going from understudy to now 
literally now learning the role and performing it yeah. how many times a week how has the character changed well, for I think you the it's most? been informed a lot by the different audiences honestly that that um, you know the New York audience was so on board with funny girl you know like they are here you know it's, it's crazy like, you yeah. you were in in, in the New yeah, York audience yeah. and you you felt that yeah and you know from the moment from our first preview in April of 2022, I have never heard, and including Book of Mormon, which was a, a riot and you Huge know hit. shook the yeah. house with yeah. laughter every night. I have never heard responses like I did to this show. I mean, people, it's the thing about this show is it it's not just a show, it's a theatrical event because yeah. people know Barbra Streisand, they know the songs, they know the show, but they haven't seen a first class production of it, most likely. And so it's an event for them to come see this show. It's not just another show. Um, and so that was very clear. So I think doing it on the road you know i i had to to learn you know something ramin said to me very early on was she he said you know she, it's her show and you look the best when you are are just totally absorbed in her and allow her and it was very clear the staging too from early on michael mayer saying you know you're the sort of the tent pole that sort of stands still and keeps every and she's sort of you know, revolves around you. And that was an interesting way to think of it, that, you know, you have to kind of hold the center and let her do her, her you know, crazy, you know, Fanny Bryce thing um, and, and sort of keep keep everything grounded. I mean, that's really your job in the show. And so that was it. That was probably where I, the biggest difference was just really trying to find that grounding and the rooting um, and just remain, you know, as truthful as possible um, and, and not get too sidetracked by, like you said, like the iconic moments, you know, just really trying to, to stay truthful with it. And then I think for me too, you know, diving into the humor of it was, was, was something that was really fun with Katarina and, and Hannah Shakeman too plays the role, you know, uh, that certain performances, um, like really trying to make it genuinely funny, you know? Yeah. And the humor glues it all together. Yeah. The humor is what makes act yeah. two work yeah. because if you, the humor just, yeah, the audience is just yeah. so into Otherwise, it. Otherwise, it's just people and and don't rain on my parade. I mean, right. yes, you have 100%. To, there has to be something else to the show, and I totally. think that's what was wonderful about it is that I didn't feel like I was just sitting there waiting for yeah. the iconic songs to come. Yeah. I actually enjoyed every minute of it. Yeah. So, well, and, yeah. and from my standpoint, never seeing the stage show, having seen the movie a couple of times, but I know people and I know don't rain on my parade. It was a whole new experience, yeah. and I was yeah. there for every minute yeah. of it. Um, but we need to talk about the character Nick. Yeah. <laughs> Such a difficult character because yeah. he's the villain but he's not the villain right um and then people say oh well you know the character of fanny bryce you know it's a misogynistic piece because she's called ugly for almost the whole time yeah and she still never gets that confidence right and nick doesn't give it to her either right um how do you approach a character like this and is he the villain of the show well, I think you have to look at the world that they're operating in, you know. So I, I do get frustrated when people say, you know, he's the villain or it's such a dated piece or the gender dynamics are. Yes, they're not. It's what, dangerous, especially well, in today's current yes, climate. And, and they are not what we would like them to be today. But I think you can't do a musical written in 1964 and hold it by our standards today. You just can't. I mean, you have to acknowledge that the world has changed. People don't do that to Shakespeare. They don't do that to opera. They don't do that to ballet. They do it point. to musicals because it's a young art form. So they expect a musical to be written today even though it was written 60 years ago, and that's not fair. Yeah. So I think the question is, is this a story of, of a real person? Yes. Are these gender dynamics that existed at the time? Yes. Are they, do they still exist today? I mean, I don't think that it's so, so far off of today. You know, I think that a, a man feeling emasculated because his wife is more successful is... is it it, it 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 feels gross to talk about, but that is a real thing that happens to people. It's like in Carousel, you know. People say, "Oh, we shouldn't do Carousel because he hits his wife," and and, and she I loves think him for. The, I mean, the question yeah. is, isn't is that right? Of course, it's not right. Of course, we're not endorsing that. Is this something that has happened to women over millennia? Yes. Mm -hmm. Is this a dynamic that has existed for hundreds of years? Yes. The story of the show is that she overcomes it. I think that's what people miss when they talk about this. The story of the show is that that she realizes that she doesn't need a man to tell her she's beautiful, that, that she has this other thing, which is the theater. It's not her mom. It's not her best friend. It's not any of these other things. It's the theater that's going to, to, to you know, give her the life that she's always dreamed of. So in some ways, it's the opposite of the like Prince Charming fairy tale ending, and, and it's her taking responsibility for her life herself, which I think is what's so inspiring about it. In order to have that, 
you have to have this foil, which is Nick Arnstein, this guy that she thinks is going to give her all this and ultimately doesn't. You know, I think that's the, the story of it. Yeah. You know, there are moments that the audience gasped at some of the lines that you said because some yeah. of it was very b- biting because we yeah. fall in love with Fanny Bryce. Yeah. We're supposed to. We fall in love with Nick yeah. because we're supposed to. Um, that has to play with your psyche, too. It's like, oh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Moment, I love so. it. I love it because people it means that people are invested in the story. Mm. Yeah. And um, it means that they're surprised. And I think that the second act, you know, of this show can can get so bogged down in, in sort of melodrama if, you, if you're not careful with it. And so I think that those moments are so authentic to who these characters are and they're so authentic to the, the journey that they're on. And it, it's also kind of unlike anything else I've ever seen in a musical, you know, and again, getting back to like people haven't really seen Funny Girl. They, they have a general idea of it, but they haven't really seen it. And, and they haven't um, seen Nick sing so much as, yeah. as, as well. And I think that, that um, you know, those moments are very, they're very authentic to what the character is going through. And, on, you know, people, people love to talk about, you know, how, you know, how the character of Nick is problematic. And, and again, I'd say, like, this is a, a real marriage we're seeing. You know what I mean? These people were married. Obviously, it's fictionalized. Obviously, these characters are polished, you know, to an extent that they weren't in real life. But... Um, you know, this is a dynamic I think that, you know, is is truthful to some some certain part of, of what their story was. And so I, I think that I w- that's important. Sorry. I, I wonder if it if it's not a part of our social media world. We've, you brought that up. You yeah. made mention of it earlier that people don't have as many like intimate conversations with each other. They yeah. don't they don't deal with issues in a deep way a lot yeah. of the time. And then when they're in a theater and you're there, you know, yeah. it's real. It's not a movie. It's not social media. And somebody's speaking those words. I do right. think that they're, I think that's exciting. It is exciting. Yeah. It is exciting. And I, you know, honestly, and there are, again, different audiences interpret the show very differently. Mm-hmm. And there are places where I can tell I am the villain and they just don't like me. And I'm like, <laughs> great. I've done my job then. If that's yeah. how you're going to interpret this story, um, you know, I have found that, you know, part of the, 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 the responsibility of this character is to to I did, you know have a, a sort of a contract with the audience from the beginning that you know there's a little bit of danger here there's a little bit of danger with this person but also to make him a real human being so they care about you mm-hmm. you know what i mean and and those like you said those moments in the second act when i hear those gasps it means they're on board because they care they care about both people yeah you know they care yeah, they're about probably fanny disappointed and they care about in yeah exactly yeah, and that yeah. that is i think that that's a good sign mm-hmm. you know well and fanny's not without her faults too she's a terrible daughter she's not the best wife you know what i mean but she's a great on stage yeah. um but it's also uh you know how many relationships have we been in that just are not right but mm. we try and try so hard to make it work yeah. because of our own insecurities yeah. i need this person so i feel valued yeah. and no yeah, you have more value being strong on your own rather than right. putting up with. Right. with and that's all ultimately this. what makes you know not to spoiler alert. Um, you know, not <laughs> to give away the ending, but what makes they the all die ending, in the end. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they go on Titanic and it's never come back. Total bloodbath. <laughs> no, um, can you imagine? No, but um, <laughs> no, the ending is so poignant because they do love each other. You know, mm. it's not a, it's not a case of not them not loving each other. It's a case of two people with different, two different ambitions. You know, there's a line right before people where she says, "You could get lonely." being so free and I say you could get lonely being so busy and they're both lonely for for different reasons and they try to make this thing work Mm -hmm. and they love each other and they just can't and that is you know again we've all had relationships like that and I think that's what really touches people about the show and why why the ending is so cathartic to have her sort of rise from the ashes Mm -hmm. you know do you think Nick ever comes back I don't God. I mean, I that's don't. That's chilling. I, don't, I mean, you know, he's, it's, he's a the, father you know, too. Funny lady on the, stage, well, yeah. I, that's why <laughs> what really gets me at the, in the final scene when she says, "You know, your your daughter is like a young lady, and he knows he's probably never going to see his kid again." I mean, that's the sto- that's the story I've concocted in my head. And in real life, I think it was probably more complicated. But you know, Fanny does say in her memoirs that Nick was the love of her life, and also that she never knew when he was telling the truth and when he was lying to her, which I find fascinating. You know, I think of him sometimes like, um, catch me if you can. You know what I mean? Like this guy that mm-hmm. is just so good at pulling off a con that no, I don't think he knows he when he's lying. He conned himself. Right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I don't think he knows when he's being honest and mm-hmm. when he's lying, you know? Which is chilling because every time he says, you know, you're beautiful, you're, you're, you know, it's like, well, you know. Yeah. He's sort of so in the moment because yeah. he doesn't really know. Yeah, he doesn't yeah. really have a grasp of completely. I mean, and I think is, he, yeah. does, he does, he does, think she's beautiful and and he does you know it's he's had gorgeous women he's had uh, you know anything his heart desires 
And she's the first one, I think, that really challenges him and gives him something else. And she's intelligent and she's funny and she's warm. And she's all these things that these, you know, the first scene I come on with these two beautiful women and it's something different. And I think that that's what ultimately binds them together. You know? I love when she says, I don't think they've eaten for. Yeah, <laughs> they look hungry. Yeah. <laughs> you know, something that we've been talking about in the last decade, finally, is uh, mental health with 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 mm, actors. Yeah. You know, before actors were like, I'm presentational and what you see on social media or in the interviews. What you have to go through vocally and even emotionally, you know, at the end, like, you know, how you take that home. But obviously, physically, you're yeah. keeping it up. Obviously, mm-hmm. vocally, you're keeping it up. But how mentally do you take care of yourself on the road? So that's a great question. I mean, I think, you know, for me, um, you know, sleep has always been a challenge, you know, in being in different hotel rooms and different, you have that you know, performance beds energy and too. different, you have that performance energy. So really taking control, that's been a big journey uh, for me, has been really taking responsibility for my sleep, trying to limit screen time, trying to do all the things that everybody knows you should do and we never do. I have to do them because otherwise I don't sleep, you know. I, um, and so sleep has been a big one. Um you know, stay, st- you know, letting myself, you know, stay close to like my voice teacher and people who, you know, asking for help when I need it and really reaching out and saying like, hey, this isn't working. Can you help me? That's a new experience for me. And when I was a younger performer, I couldn't do that. Because mm-hmm. yeah. we're taught like right. on your yeah. own. Like, yeah. And Book of Mormon was a really hard saying. I mean, that's that score is really hard to sing. And I, I wasn't at a point yet where I took ownership of mm. that responsibility and, you know, I ha- could ask for help. I thought I had to have it all figured out. You know what I mean? And instead of saying like, hey, can we try this? Can we, you know, um, so that that has been a big one is just knowing myself as a performer better what I need and asking for it has been a big, a big part of this journey. Um, and then meditation is huge for me. You know, I've, I really try to like at a certain point like turn off the politics turn off you, you know the like political podcast and put on like like dharma talks because that just for me like i think part of it is like their voices are so soothing when they you know um and and just really trying to get meditation in every day is really important for me too um and just having a routine to exercise is so important for me um it's it really you know if i go three four days without exercise which sometimes happens because you're on the road and there's yeah. not a good gym you or can you're go to exhausted. Or you're exhausted you know um so so really trying to just move and get exercise get endorphins going you know this has been such a joy oh, by the way and you know what i love is like the behind the scenes you know yeah. this is what we see on stage um yeah. so it's been such such a joy uh what's your message to your fans um i'd say you know I guess it's it's that you know if you really believe in yourself and you really um, think that you have a skill set you know then then don't get waylaid by the people telling you you have to be anything other than what you are you know um, show up authentically and see what happens it's not going to be what you think will happen but if you show up authentically something will happen and that is more exciting I think <laughs> than the sort of predetermined outcome that a lot of us want when we start out um, so I'd say you know show up authentically own that, take responsibility for it, and, um, you know, see what happens. Which is kind of the message of a funny girl. Yeah. Like, yeah. make it your own. Like, yeah. Yeah. it's totally. going to work out. Totally. Uh, okay, Funny Girl uh, tour dates. Go to funnygirlonbroadway.com. It runs in Southern California at the Amundsen until April 28th. Um, then it goes to San Francisco. Then it's back in SoCal at the Seagerstrom Center for the Arts from May 28th to June 9th. Um, what has been your favorite c- city so far? LA, baby. <laughs> Did you just say that just to be nice? I mean, you say that to all the girls. No, we were, I was so excited. I love LA. I love coming out here. I've come out here, you know, a few different times for work things over my career. And I just, every time I come out, I just, I feel like the energy matches my energy really well. And I just yeah. love it. So I, this is by far my favorite city. The audiences here have been phenomenal. Thank you so much. Uh, please keep coming. Um, and, um, you know, one, one interesting one, Des Moines, we were in Des Moines a few weeks ago. And I was like, oh my God, what am I doing here? Yeah. And it was a great time. <laughs> Town. It yeah. was really, I mean, I found all these cute little coffee shops and bookstores and, um, you know, I had a great time there. So, you know, I'm, I'm constantly surprised by the communities we get to do the show for and how they respond to it. And, you know, it's really, uh, it's it's exciting. Uh, where can people find and follow you? Uh, at SM Lucas on Instagram. You don't post that much, um, by the way. I know. I'm, I'm lazy about it, but I, I'm like I do a lot. In, I know. Hello. I do a lot in my stories. <laughs> I'm gonna yes. get better. I'm trying to get better at it. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. At SM Lucas on Instagram. Um, that's the best way to get in touch with me. Yeah. Absolutely. Where, Thank you so much. This was like this is amazing. Thank really, you so much. Happy to be here. It really, you. it was Absolutely. a pleasure. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Where can we find and follow you? 
Me, Michael Ferreira on Instagram. That's pretty much it. Mm. Yeah, or Grinder. <laughs> or Grinder. <laughs> uh, what what a fun fun episode. Uh, go see Funny Girl if it comes to a city near you. If not, travel to go see it. Um, really really great show and a very special theater um, experience. Uh, what, what a great cast. Um, so Cal, I will be your baseball announcer for Drag Queen World Series game between the West Hollywood cheerleaders and the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence on Saturday, April twenty seventh at one p.m. at Fairfax High School, hosted by. Life Group LA, benefiting three nonprofits in the community. Uh, TV, TV and theater personality Jay Rodriguez will be singing the national anthem. Uh, so I won't joke with him about that. Head to dragqueenworldseries.com <laughs> for more info and to get your tickets. Um, as always, it's always a grab bag of fun here every weekend on The Rocks. A big thank you to our engineer and station owner, Tony Sweet, our social media clip editor, Alexis Mendez. Uh, thank you to House of Love Cocktails, by the way. Everybody say love. Mm-hmm. Please like, share, subscribe <laughs> so we can continue bringing the show to you for free. Until next time, stay happy, stay healthy, stay sexy, and if you drink, stay tipsy. Woohoo! <laughs> this has been another episode of On the Rocks. Tweet me and slide into my DMs on Twitter and Instagram at On the Rocks On Air. Find everything On the Rocks for free at ontherocksradioshow.com. Subscribe, like, review, and share. Until next week, stay fabulous.